I'm going to ask a hard question. Yes. You don't have to answer it. Did you contemplate, like, death? I really did not. And I'll tell you huh. one time, I remember I was in the hospital and I was with my mom and I was like waiting to get some kind of scan or something and it was taking forever. And I remember asking my mom about, it was like the only time death crossed my mind. And she looked at me like, this is crazy. I don't know that I've ever talked about this before publicly, but probably you get a lot of this mime because you're, <laughs> who, who doesn't want to tell you so? <laughs> Um, and I remember my mom looked at me with both eyes, mm -hmm. which is a really hard thing to do because I'm mm -hmm. not, now I'm going to make, but like, you know how you normally look yes. at one eye yeah, yeah. someone? Okay. She looked at with she both eyes. She looked you eyes. dead in the eyes. She looked me dead in the eyes. Uh, no. No. Fun yeah. intended. <laughs> okay. And she said, Vanessa, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. And then I was over it. That was the only time I remember being scared because I think I was so optimistic about it. I just wasn't letting myself sort of go into that space. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Maya and Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. We got a fun one today. And it's a fun one. And they're sibling. We're going to be talking to Vanessa Bayer today. Vanessa Bayer was on SNL. You might know her from Saturday Night Live. She was on for seven seasons. Um, she's also been in Trainwreck, and her show, I Love That For You, was a show she co-created that was inspired by her life. Her brother, Jonah Bayer, they have a podcast together. Their podcast is called How Did We Get Weird with Vanessa Bayer and Jonah Bayer. I'm going to talk to Vanessa first, talk to her about her very interesting teenage experience, she was diagnosed with leukemia at 15 and has an incredible perspective on how that shaped her comedy and her life. And then we're going to bring on Jonah, talk about their sibling dynamic and the incredible work that they do together. He also is a mental health professional. He recently finished a counseling program and they're just such an interesting sibling duo. I cannot wait Jonathan is not here today, but Vanessa is here in person. So let's get started with Vanessa Bayer, and Jonathan's really going to love this episode because there's a lot about Blossom in it. Let's start with Vanessa Bayer. Welcome to The Breakdown. Break it down. Wow, I am so excited to be here, Maya. Is your teenage self excited? <laughs> yeah, and my adult self. <laughs> um, it's very, very nice to have you here. Um, I'm a fan of yours in many ways. And not just because people are like, the two of you kind of look alike. And I was like, Jews, we're just Jews. <laughs> exactly. We're not all related, but kind of we are. In some way. Um, let's just get it out of the way. Yes. Because if yes. Jonathan were here, this would be the first yes. and only thing he'd want me to talk about. So you are six years younger than me, which means you were kind of prime age to watch Blossom. And apparently you did. I was <laughs> obsessed with Blossom. Um, when my brother joins later, we'll talk about how we did... Um, or we can talk about it now. We'll, we did um, a whole show uh, honoring Blossom. <laughs> I used to watch it so much as a kid. And then as a teenager, it was on, re it was be like reruns in like the early evening. And uh -huh. I would watch everything again. Remember when you went to Paris? I do I mean, remember that. Can you even believe it? And I was obsessed with it. And then when I moved to Chicago as a young adult doing improv and that stuff, I would watch reruns late at night <laughs> and I started following all the cast and everything. Oh and that's sort of how I became friends with Jenna Von Oy because she followed wow. me back. I don't know. This is how we met, okay? I watched the finale of Blossom and I had remembered it being different. And huh. so I messaged her. No, you didn't. On, <laughs> yes, I messaged her on Instagram. <laughs> I direct messaged her. <laughs> And I said, um, now, I wish I had looked it up because when she came on my podcast, I looked up the exact conversation. But I said something to the effect of, I watched the finale. It was not what I remember. What I remember is that it was sort of like a breaking the fourth wall thing mm. where you realize it's a show, it's a TV show, and you kind of call it out as being a TV show and it's uh, whatever. And then she wrote me back. Now I'm giving you more specific details oh, than I, I want would normally. Okay. She wrote me back and she said, I think you're not thinking of the finale. I think you're thinking of an episode that came a few episodes earlier called Episode. Oh. Where I, where, Blossom has a dream that six is Blossom. Oh, yes. 
And that's what I think it was. And waking up from the dream and stuff. You know, not to question Jenna Von Oye's expertise, because that yes. woman's got a mind like a steel trap. But it, is it not true that in our final episode, we did kind of I could have sworn, but I really. I don't think you do. Here's unless, the story. Okay. I was stone cold sober for all those years, and I remember very little okay. of anything that happened. Jenna, I mean, she is our best yes. kind of biographer, but I know that Don Rio, who created Blossom, yeah. um, you know, he he really wanted to, you know, make that last episode, you know, kind of special. Yes. I seem to remember that we broke that part of the law at some point. Well, maybe, maybe not. Because I watched the episode she told me about yeah. called episode. And I was like, I think you're right. I think that's what I was thinking. Of. Okay. But I also wonder if when I watch um, the the finale, and we're going to call it in 2008. <laughs> like I watched it like years and years. I, I wonder if because it was on, it was like a rerun. I wonder if they cut off like the oh. ending or something where that, because I almost remember you, I remember like you waking up on the couch and I don't know. I, I, but anyways, Jenna Manoy responded to me. Oh no. So this must've been when I was living in New York. I think I was living in New York. So I was already on SNL and then. Wait, the, you were on SNL and watching Blossom at the same time? Every night. That's kind of insane. So she wrote me back and then immediately when I asked her about this finale episode. And then like two weeks later, she wrote me back and she was like, oh, I just realized who you are and that you're on <laughs> SNL. So I, she, she, it wasn't because of like who I was. It was right. just because I was a fan and I needed this information about the finale. hundred percent. So, sorry, I'm just like, I mean, you, you had an amazing run on Wait, SNL. I'm not which, ready no, to but move I, on yet. No, but I, I was going to, it was, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, no, you're not no, done. No, go. Okay. I need you to get I it all out. I have one more thing that I have to ask you about. Okay. Your clothes on that show yes. were so incredible. How much say, like, did you, I, just the level, I keep thinking about, I'm sorry, I'll stop freaking It's fine. Out. I keep thinking about like the, remember the very 90s thing of like, shirts that were like striped everywhere and were sort of um, ribbed. Yeah. You had a lot of, the, you were pulling that off. Yeah. Like all of your outfits were so cool. How, what was that process like? Okay, and so, I know that this is your podcast. No, it's fine. This is literally, I mean, it's as if Jonathan's here. Like, is there a bug in your ear? And Jonathan's like, <laughs> ask her about this. So we had a, a designer. Her name was Sherry Thompson. Okay. And um, she really, she really was, you know, the, um, the brain behind sort of what we wanted this character to look like. And Sherry was just like one of these awesome designers who just like always looked amazing. You know, yeah. she wore like these like big, like cool, like, you know, artsy tops and like leggings before people were wearing leggings, right. you know, like all the time. And she always had just like cool shoes. And she had a lot of um, clothing from her travels yeah. around the world. And so this was something that like she felt was really important as part of Blossom's style um, that there was fabrics and styles from kind of everywhere. And, you know, sometimes we did like more plain stuff. And like, as I got older and was more of like a surly teenager in real life, I was like, oh my gosh, like, does every outfit have to be like <laughs> so reinventing crazy. the wheel? Um, so, you know, we definitely did like crop tops with like pants with overalls, like, you know, things I like mean, that. Um, to a T. But, but yeah, but in the, in the early years, especially, you know, it was seen as very unusual. And, and look, I mean, you were, a little bit younger than me, but growing up, like girls like us, we didn't go on television. Right. You right. know, like nobody looked like, like, yeah. like the Jewish girl next door, or like the girl, you know, from summer camp. Except like, you looked so cool. That's, well, <laughs> I mean, I think like that remains to be, uh, that's up for debate. But I think the notion that like, I wasn't sort of like this, like classic teenage leading lady, like, right, right, I think right. we wanted the clothing to reflect. Yeah. Like this is a, quirky kind of girl. And I was a very eclectic dresser, you know, as well. My parents were as well. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. And I, I loved your clothes. And I also just want to say before I forget, and then we can move on. You are just so funny on that <laughs> show. And everybody, like to me, it's the show that when people are like, what show is still, like still if I watch an episode of Blossom, I am laughing out loud. It is such a funny show. And everyone's timing is so good. Like it was, it's crazy. It was a very well-written show. But the way that you like kind of like zinc, like it just, <laughs> it really is incredible how funny you are on that show. Like you're that's a kid very, very and sweet. your timing is like. Okay, so here's a question. Okay. Did that impact your SNL I run. guess that's why I went into <laughs> probably it probably did. I just can't imagine that you were, you know, one of the one of the longest running females, you know, on yeah. like literally 
the show that comedians want to be on. I was once at an NBC party because Blossom was an NBC show, you know, back uh, in the day. A- and so I once got to go, um, once got to go to an NBC party. Um, I think it was before I had kids. And I ran into like Tina Fey and Maya Rudolph and Amy Poehler in like the bathroom. Like the it was at um it was at like Rockefeller. Mm, duh. It was like at the ice skating rink and there was, you yeah. know, a thing. And I just like went to pee and like they were there and they also mentioned like, oh my God, you were on blot. It was so bizarre. Oh, yeah. I think just, I mean, I don't know. I wonder if you you feel this way. Like, you know, there's part of your work that's just like, it's yours. It exists on a stage and then it, you know, kind of goes out there. But um, it's very strange to me, you know, and very flattering, but very strange to hear that, you know, that people <laughs> watch oh my God. Blossom, like just... especially even into... It's an incredible the show. It really is. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. That you're so young and you're just like, it's great. <laughs> it's really funny. So let's talk a little bit about you. <laughs> okay, I'll maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, so you grew up in Ohio. Cleveland, yes. Outside of Cleveland? A suburb of Cleveland where everyone's from. Okay, got, got it. <laughs> um, and were your parents also from Cleveland? Oh, yes. Just everybody's, everybody's Midwest. From, yes, everybody from the Midwest. Okay. Um, from the, yeah, we were from the, like, Northeast Ohio, the eastern suburbs of Cleveland. Okay, yeah. got it. And um, you you have a brother. We're going to talk to him soon. Yes. Um, and it sounds like both of your parents kind of were f- naturally funny. I mean, not industry funny, yes. correct? Our dad was, like, a real, um, the real ham amongst his friends. Like, mm-hmm. he was the one who was always making jokes and doing impressions for his friends. And I think our mom was more of a... Um, more of a, had more of a light, lighter touch with her comedy, but mm-hmm. always just naturally very funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But neither of them were entertainers? No, or, not at all. Uh, our mom worked at the JCC. She was head of early Jewish childhood, community the center, Jewish community center, um, and still has a, a lifelong pass to go. Of course. Unfortunately, <laughs> does not extend to us, which I'm <laughs> a little pissed about. Tragic. Um, but, and our dad uh, had a, had a packaging company. So like they didn't work oh. in, in that stuff at all, but they were um, supportive of us doing kind of creative things. So that mm-hmm. was very nice. My Alex Breakdown is supported by Hatch. Taking care of ourselves is so important. Healthy eating and exercise are often a focus, but something just as important that we talk about a lot here that many people overlook is making sure to get quality rest. With the Hatch Restore, take control of your sleep habits and wake up feeling your absolute best. The Hatch Restore is your bedside sleep guide, your ally in rest. The innovative all-in-one dream machine is a sophisticated sound machine, light, and alarm clock beautifully designed for your bedside table. Good rest allows you to be the best version of yourself, which is why the Hatch Restore was engineered to help you form healthy sleep habits for life. Your hatch teaches your body when it's time to sleep and when it's time to rise. With light and sound cues, it coaches you through meditations and mindfulness exercises that transform the time before and after sleep into restful rituals. With hatch, you'll sleep deeply with white, pink, or brown noise or other sleep sounds inspired by nature. No more jarring alarms. You wake gently with a sunrise alarm clock that supports your natural circadian rhythm. I love my hatch. First of all, it's beautiful. You can't even tell that it's an alarm clock and does all the things that it does, but I love it, and it has absolutely made the those transitions so much easier, which for me is key to getting better sleep. Great sleep can't be forced, but it can be learned. And the Hatch Restore is here to help. Right now, Hatch is offering our listeners $20 off your purchase of a Hatch Restore and free shipping at hatch.co slash break. Sleep deeply and wake gently with the Restore. Go to hatch.co slash break to get $20 off and free shipping. That's hatch.co slash break. Miami Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. From time to time, we all experience racing thoughts that keep us up at night, wake us up early, or prevent us from being able to enjoy life. I know this is true for me. Do you ever find that just as you're trying to fall asleep, your brain all of a sudden won't stop talking to you, or your thoughts start racing like right before bed when you need to get rest or at other inopportune times? Well, it turns out a great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through, and I have found this to be true in therapy, and Jonathan has as well. Therapy gives you a place to do that to get out of negative thought cycles and find mental and emotional peace. If you're thinking of starting therapy, please give BetterHelp a try. 
It's online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and it's suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and they'll match you with a licensed therapist. Plus, you can switch at any time for no additional charge. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today. They'll give you 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. When you were 15, you were diagnosed with the L word, Leuke- yeah. leukemia. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know this about you. Like, I mean, I kind yeah. of like knew it in sort of satellite, like, oh yeah, I had heard. And you also, um, you wrote a really beautiful um, children's book. It's called How Do You Care for a Very Sick Bear? Right. Yes. Um, and um, I mean, I know it sounds like possibly the dumbest question ever, but no. um, it's really, what do you remember of that time? Well, I'm sure I was watching Blossom during that time, but also, <laughs> sorry, sorry, real question. Okay. Um, well, you like, know. do you remember like, oh, I'm not feeling what, like, was it that kind of thing? Yes, it was that kind of a thing. It was, well, to, to get really into the like details of it, my eye swelled up and we didn't know why. Mm. And I was getting these headaches and stuff. And so basically first they thought it might be like a rheumatoid thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, um, they realized that I did all this testing and they realized that it was leukemia and, um, I was always pretty, um, I was always pretty optimistic about getting through it and everything, but it was a really crazy thing where I was in ninth grade, I guess it was over spring break of ninth mm-hmm. grade that I was diagnosed. And then I just didn't go back to school for the rest of the year. Oh. And, um, I had like 10 months of intense chemo and then two more years of maintenance chemo. Cause it's one of those cancers that they treat for a really long time. So it yeah. doesn't come back. Um, but I remember, you know, that I, I had the show, I Love That For You. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so one of the things with that, that that we would talk about was like, I wanted to do something about how really when I was when I was sick, I, I really tried to get like as many perks as I could <laughs> out of it. And so like as someone who already liked attention, it was, you know, and I'm and I, you know, I think you remember sometimes like the more positive things or at least sure. I do. Uh but so I just remember, um, you know, it was hard. I hated missing school, especially at that age. Like you of just want to be so part social of things. And, and yeah. I hated that. And like I went back to school in 10th grade, but I missed something like 45 days or something like that. But um, also people really were like, I was very special for my grade. And I got to not do gym class. <laughs> and I got to like do all these kind of like things. And I really, um, I really sort of was like, I'm going to, I'm going to really make the most of this. So I mm. feel like. As much as, you know, it's something, it was a, you know, a scary and, you know, Mm -hmm. hard thing. I also, and I also think that it really helped my friends a lot for me to joke about it. Like Mm -hmm. it sort of put them at ease. So I had all these jokes, which I don't know how funny they are in retrospect, (laughs) but I remember like an example of a joke I used a lot was like, you think you're so cool because your hair is real, you know, because I'd be wearing a wig or something. And, but I was like, it put them at ease and reminded them that I was still the same person. Did you, I mean, not to get deeply yeah. pathological about it, did you feel like you had to make other people feel okay about it? I think that was part of it for sure. And I think that's such a big thing with people who yeah. are going through it. Like you just, it's, I don't know. It's like so many of us have that thing of like wanting to like make sure everybody else is like, mm-hmm. feels okay about things. But I, um, I just... I, it was helpful for me to laugh about it, I think, too. And also, I just do think that sometimes, and this is sort of some of the stuff in my children's book, is like sometimes when someone gets sick or is going through some kind of trauma, like people think that they're different now or something mm. and they don't have the same personality right. and they're like, they have a whole new, like right. there's a whole new person in there. And it's not, it's just that they're dealing with this thing. So I think it kind of, I wanted to remind my friends that like I still like joking about the same stupid things. Mm -hmm. I still wanted to know every single bit of gossip that was going on in my Mm -hmm. grade. Like I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't like the person who only thinks about like medical. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, I I would imagine that that was probably also supported. It sounds like your parents probably, you know, um, but also now that you're a grown up, like also must have been terrifying. Um, I'm going to ask a hard question. You don't have to answer it. Did you contemplate like death? I really did not. And I'll tell you huh. one time I remember I was in the hospital and I was with my mom and I was like waiting to get some kind of scan or something and it was taking forever. And I remember asking my mom about it. It was like the only time death crossed my mm. mind. 
And she looked at me like, this is crazy. I don't know that I've ever talked about this before publicly, but probably you get a lot of this mime because you're, <laughs> who, who doesn't want to tell you stuff? Um, and I remember my mom looked at me with both eyes, mm. which is a really hard thing to do because I'm mm-hmm. not, now I'm going to make you, but like, you know how you normally look yes. at one eye yeah, of yeah. someone? Okay. She looked at with she both eyes. She looked you eyes. dead in the eyes. She looked me dead in the eyes. Uh, no. No. Fun yep. intended. <laughs> okay. And she said, Vanessa, you're not going to die. Mm. And then I was over it. That was the only time I remember being scared because I think I was so optimistic about it that I just wasn't letting myself sort of go into that space. I mean, I think I had other, there were definitely other things that I was worried about, but in mm-hmm. terms of death, I really, that really wasn't on my like hmm. radar really and did, you got to do a make a wish okay i, I mean sure there's did. like like there's several skits that i want to write about yes. the make a wish notion and that's a fantastic organization i've actually had the honor of participating in yes. in many wishes like you know we would have oh my uh, people gosh come people to, come to blossom no not uh, actually uh, we t- might have i don't think it was as <laughs> big of a thing but um, on Big Bang Theory, I know, we had some really... I know. <laughs> like, you were on another enormous <laughs> show, and I'm like, people came to Blossom, though, right? <laughs> but I'm people sure like the Big Bang Theory. But probably the organization was more developed yeah, by I don't the know time of Big were Bang like, Theory. I might die, but I have to go on Blossom set. <laughs> no, it's more of the Big Bang thing. But um, but I I really, you know, I'm, I mean, I've heard like, you know, I've heard several yes. stand-up comedians like do bits about Make-A-Wish, but like... Um, what did you choose? Okay, first of all, and I want to... Also, were you adorable? Uh, well, I mean, I've seen pictures of you as a little one. Well, like, I was a teenager, so right. I... I Well, so I don't think I was, like, you know, I I, I didn't look like a cute kid, which right. when, when you see cute kids on make yes. wishes, you go, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> you were like, like, yeah. I was like, teenager. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so I... This is an interesting story. So I... Um, and so, and also, just a just a um, thing that a lot of people don't know is that you don't have to be terminal to do Make a Wish anymore. You, for the past, I can do it. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway, you just have to have a life threatening disease. So just find okay. something in your medical history that you <laughs> could <it>. exploit. <laughs> well, you have to be, I think, eighteen or younger. But okay. retroactively, I don't know what the <laughs> rules are. But the point is, I so I have so I ended up going to Hawaii with my family, which was that was your wish. Really, that was my wish. But, okay, but was that, was that what you really wanted to be wished to be? That was what I wanted my wish to be because I'll tell you that I have another funny story about it, which is that I initially I was really into my so called life. And I wanted to meet Jared Leto. That was going to be my wish. Because you can meet anyone, go anywhere, or get anything. Like, at that time, a lot of people were getting computers because, like, the internet was pretty new. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. So a lot of people— Little did we know you'd be holding one in your hand in another 20 years. (laughs) Who needed to make a wish? I mean, you can pick pick one of those up on any corner. But at the time, you know, you'd have to get the whole setup with the computer and the— Well, basically the same as you need now. But the point is, (laughs) their laptops aren't as big. But the point is— I was like, I want to meet Jared Leto. And then, so I was <laughs> and thinking... And take him to Hawaii. And take him to Hawaii. So that was going to be my wish. And then I said to my parents that I actually would, I would prefer to meet Jared Leto in the future when we're peers. So instead, I'd like to go to Hawaii. And my parents were like, okay. <laughs> but then when I was on SNL, I was presenting at the MTV Video Awards. And so was Stop Jared it. Leto. Stop and I don't it. Remember no, it's crazy. Did you tell him you almost wished I, for him when you I, had looking at him? I, it's unclear how this went down, and I need to ask her again. But our SNL publicist, like, saw his publicist, told him, and then I think his publicist told him, and then he came up to me and he said, "You're." He took a picture I would of die. us together. I, I would die. die, and he put it on his Instagram, so I had <laughs> access to the picture. I didn't even have Instagram yet; like, Instagram was pretty new. And um, he said to me, he said, I think you're a very talented actress. And so I don't know that he knew who I was, because usually that's not what you say to people who are on I SNL. Know. You don't know. I don't know. But anyways, he was so nice, and I was dead. I was just like, <laughs> this is so crazy that that I— and It's also, good you didn't waste your wish yes, on him. I know. I know. What if I'd wasted my wish? And then I saw him again at the MTV Awards, <laughs> and I was like, oh, nice to see you again. Uh, this is awkward. <laughs> um. I happen to be looking at this picture of you in Hawaii. So, like, you're all gingies. We're all gingies. <laughs> like, you go I know. Totally... Our mom has red. Our mom is. My I... uncle David was a redhead. Like okay, that. yes. I and wanna... your brother is also like, he's yes. kind of coppery. Yes. I want to say that our mom is. Jonah can... She's 70. 
Um, still red. Se- yes. They She's often don't. Early go 70s, gr- yeah. still red hair. It's a, the red it's jean crazy. is a thing. Um, also, I'm really digging <laughs> your outfit because I just, we'll, we'll post this picture. You're in like the super baggy jeans. You're well, beautiful. Jonah, I mean, like, you're like, I mean, you're just beaming. You're like, I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> well, because I think Ugh. that we worked it out so that I was able to go on that trip when I was, I think by the time I did it, I was done with chemo and stuff. Your so hair I, had. So I'm just, yeah, yeah I'm, ch- I'm like. And I think I had just gotten into college early, so I was like, That's "I'm set." Adorable. Here. That was high school. Yes, you were voted most likely to succeed. I'm going to say something that I hope you don't think is in bad taste. Were yeah. they like, "She fucking beat leukemia"? <laughs> She's, She's gonna. gonna... <laughs> oh, I. I mean, I was. I think people were like, I, "That was." I was a shoe in. It would have been so <laughs> weird to vote for someone else. <laughs> yeah. I think that's um, amazing. Yeah, I think I um, in that one. So you. Were, did you know you wanted to be a comedian? Like, was that oh, clear you, to you? You've really walked into a trap, which is me <laughs> talking about my all-female sketch comedy and musical parody troupe in college called I'm Bloomers. I'm ready for it. Okay. Well, but you, you, you didn't major in theater. No. You majored in French and communications. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, was learning such good communication <laughs> stuff. Um, it's funny because my brother went to Ithaca College and he he majored in communications and learned a lot of practical skills. And this is no <laughs> burn on my school, but like we learned like, you know, what does space teach you about uh, communication? You know, <laughs> although there were some good ch- children's uh, children in media classes and stuff mm-hmm. that made, made me want to write a children's book and all that kind of stuff. But um, so, yeah, I studied communications in French, but then I tried out for this uh, co- sketch comedy group. Hmm. And that became like, it was like, I was suddenly, you found like, your people. I found my people. Exa- that's exactly right. Cause in high school, um, obviously I had the whole leukemia thing, but also <laughs> even before that, like my, I was good at school, but all of my friends were good at sports and mm-hmm. other things. And I, you know, I was very, it's the Midwest ba- yeah, it's going to happen. I was very bad at all that stuff. And I was like, oh, it must be so nice to hmm. like get something. Um, and then when I started doing my comedy group, I was like, oh, this feels like Huh. something that I that I understand that I get. And you started uh, for that kind of sketch comedy. Mm-hmm. You're you're not just performing. You're you're writing We're as writing, well. Exactly. And you're like yeah. developing characters and yes. stuff. Yes. Um, so, you know, not to like. And we're doing song parody, too. I just don't want you to leave that out. as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Song parody. So tell us some <laughs> One of, of the, the coolest forms of uh, uh, comedy. Well, I is... think I'm a Weird Al fan. So oh, yeah. like. Oh, this is crazy. Oh, yeah. No, you're in we a very We had Weird safe Al on place. our podcast and we realized that something that I had written we, one of the things that we did in Bloomers, he had never recorded but had done live, which was the Offspring song, Keep Him Separated, yeah. about laundry. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> and that we both had the refrain, sorry to sing on your podcast. Do it. Hey, it's laundry day, instead of come out and play. I get it. <laughs> I'm grooving on it. That is really awesome. So this was, I mean, it was something that you did kind of like as a hobby, but then... It's sort of, sorry, I became director. Like okay, it so sort I was of, just going to say, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So that was going to be my next thing. I mean, it's no small thing to like get on SNL. Like this is like a real, like this, whatever path you took, yeah. different from some of the other <laughs> SNL folks. Um, well, I'm, I am the first bloomer to reach. Well, so this is what I was going to yeah. say. So was it clear that like... <sighs> You had that something. Well, then I was like, I have to do this as my job because I Got like this. I get it. It it feels so fun. So then I moved to Chicago after college. Got it. And I took improv classes and did all that stuff. But meanwhile, I um, I worked at an ad agency and some other job. I know, but because that communications degree. That communications. <laughs> de- that communi- I will say, when you graduate from college, everyone's looking for someone who is a communications major. <laughs> and I go, why? We don't know anything. But it's like, but you know how thing. to say that you don't know yeah, anything. I was, it's like, yeah. So I worked at, yeah, a production company and then this ad agency. And, um, but at night and on the weekends, I would do improv and sketch and that kind of stuff. And I always knew that I wanted to work, like, I would love to be on TV and do something like Blossom. And then, um, and then a year before I got on SNL, I got very focused on SNL and I came up with like a five minutes of right, characters. Because you have to like come up and, with. Yeah. Yeah. And then, because they used to come to, SNL used to come to Chicago like every summer. Right. Well, Chicago so for was, people who, who don't know, like 
that is sort of like, like it was like Toronto, Chicago kind of groundlings in Los Angeles. Yes, Those yeah. are kind of like the hubs of, yes. you know, of comedy. And some of, some of your favorite comedians come out of Chicago and um, Second City and like that yeah. whole, you Tina. know. Tina, I mean, Tina. Yeah, was, yeah, 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 that's that. Um, so, um, wow. So you, um, you ended up, you were on SNL for seven, seven years. years. Yeah, yeah. Do you, and I'm not asking this for kind of gossipy reasons, but... <sighs> You know, kind of, we've we've had other SNL alums here. Okay. Um, you know, did you, was your experience like, oh my gosh, this is like all these amazing creative people, but also it's crazy and hectic, and it's like kind of the craziest ride of your life? Yes, it was. It's is like, that what everybody who's I on think SNL everybody. Says? It's like okay. such high highs and such low lows because right. it's like. You can have an amazing show, but also your show going into the dress rehearsal can be amazing. And then everything you're in gets cut and then you do the live show and you're not in the show or, <laughs> or like, you know, it just, it's a yeah. hard, we, it's sort of like there's three times during the week when you have the experience of like a high school play where there's a kind of like a list up yeah. and you see if your stuff got yeah. cut, you know? So it's like whether your sketches get in and then whether your stuff makes it past dress rehearsal, whether your stuff gets cut during the live show. It's like, right. there's it's just so many times. Yeah. I'm going to say something also that yeah. I never thought I'd say. You seem really nice and easygoing. Yeah. Yeah. But also to get to this level, like, there's also an aspect of like competitiveness. Yes. I'm not saying like, did you have a bitch moment? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that like, there's also something in you that must be extremely resilient because That's... to have such a a pleasant countenance as a comedian. Right, right, right. And, you know, women, it's di like we judge our women differently and of like course, women in comedy, it's like we have all these rules of like, is she skinny enough? And like, are her tits this? Yeah. You know, whatever. But, but there's such a, there's a, there's a really, like, it feels like you're very, you're like an, 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 a normal person that like communicates well, has like thoughts, feelings, and like understands right, right, your internal right. psychology. And that kind of environment is really challenging. Yeah, it was hard. Did I mean, you feel that clash? Yeah, I did at times. And I, one thing that Kristen Wiig said to me really early that I really think was a good thing to remember was like, the, the show is competitive, like the mm. way that it's set up, like only a certain number of sketches can get in and whatever. But the people aren't like mm -hmm. it. So it's like I tried to like just focus on that. Like it was I was part of this thing that was that was inherently competitive, but that tried not to personalize it too much, which is impossible not to yeah, do. And I, I mean, would like, do that I, all the yeah. time. And then the longer you're there, the more you sort of, you know, you can sort of say things to yourself and really believe them of like, whether I'm in the show or not, I'm mm. still, I'm still getting paid the same. Right. You know, that's a real soothing thing to think yeah. about. And then also just the thing that it's, the thing that's so funny too, is like you, when, as, as someone who watches the show, like when, when you watch the show, you're not counting how many times your people that you like are in it, like how mm. many sketches are in. Right. But when you're in the show, you're like, how many sketch? And yeah. so just remembering the thing that like people would tell me that took me almost the whole time I was there to really digest is like, if you have like a couple good sketches this season that sure. stand out, that like oh, really, gosh. that's great. Right. That's well, all you, you need. I mean, you had, you know, a lot of that. Um, who was your closest, you know, kind of comrade? Like, well, I, do you have like a certain buddy that you were like, oh, this was a person that I really connected with personally? I had, I, I had, the first person who comes to mind is AD because I knew AD Bryant. We knew each other mm -hmm. in Chicago. Wow. And then she got on two years after. Wow. And that was incredible. Like, can you, like someone yeah. that you that you already know and love. Like she, that was incredible getting on with her. Taryn Killam and I became very, mm -hmm. we're still very close. And um, Beck Bennett and Kyle Mooney, though, I, you know, there was a lot of people, but 80, it was crazy because I already was good friends with her. That's so and fun. And that was insane. My Beyond Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. You know that feeling you get when you finally find the thing you've been searching for on the internet? After spending hours researching and reading thousands of reviews, you find it, the thing, whatever it is, like it could be sparkly disco pants, designer dog hoodies, whatever. The thing that checks literally all your boxes and it has five stars. Oh, and it arrives in just 48 hours. Well, why is it that you can get the most random, wonderfully reviewed thing from around the world in two days, but if you want to see a good doctor, it can take forever to get an appointment and not to mention, how do you even know if they're good? 
Thankfully, there is a way. It's called ZocDoc. It's a place to find and book great doctors who actually have amazing reviews, many with appointments available within 24 hours. ZocDoc's a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, because that's helpful. Find ones that are located near you and treat almost any condition you're searching for. These doctors all have verified reviews from actual, real patients, not bots. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between 24 to 48 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. My favorite. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately with just a few app taps. No more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. Go to ZocDoc.com breakdown. Download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. I want to invite on someone who might be familiar to you. Okay. Your brother. Um, Jonah is going to join us. Jonah's your brother. You're two years apart, correct? Yes, yes. Two years apart. And he's a writer and a musician and does many awesome things. Um, and he's currently a grad student at Antioch, which is very exciting. It's the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. Um, and I'm very excited to talk to both of you about your podcast and other fun things. So let's invite Jonah on. I'm going to put on these headphones. Yes. That's yes. what you do. Jonah, welcome to The Breakdown. Hi, ma'am. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, thank you for listening as your sister interviewed me about Blossom. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really, really nice to um, to have you. Um, and I'd, I'd love either one or both of you. It kind of, I don't know why all of a sudden I'm like, it's like having twins. Like, who's going <laughs> to answer first? Like, I don't know. Um, you have this podcast called How Did We Get Weird with Vanessa Bayer and Jonah Bayer. Um, and it's a very cool format. And I'm kind of curious, which one of you wants to talk about how you came up with this idea? Because it's such a great catch-all for like anything that could happen on a podcast. Like I'm pretty specific, like <laughs> breakdown, like we break down mental health and wellness, but this is like how we got weird could really cover anything. So who came up with it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember I, we, cause we had kind of a few different topics. I hosted a podcast in New York for like six years, mostly with musicians and comedians as guests. And then Vanessa and I wanted to do a podcast together and we threw a couple ideas. And I think, yeah, I think we want, we talk a lot about nostalgic ideas and we'll text each other. Like, do you remember this commercial? <laughs> do you remember this snack? Just randomly. Like, <laughs> yeah. And so it felt like very natural because it felt like we were doing a lot of this research anyways, just for, for no reason. Knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's kind of how it came together, but it took a little while to kind of dial it in. Did you always like each other as kids? I, can, <laughs> I'd like to take my take on this, which is that sure. Jonah sort of, um, Jonah was sort of, I always really liked Jonah, but Jonah wasn't always super into me. Um, I mean, it was like, he would be kind of mean to me, but then if he ever thought it hurt my feelings, he would like apologize. He was getting you ready for boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Just mean, mean. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he was like, not that we like, didn't, we sort of like, but we got along when we were in high school. But when he went to college, we really started getting along. Mm -hmm. I feel like because we had, I think we needed a little space maybe or something. Can I ask the awkward question? What do you remember when she was diagnosed? Because she said she already liked a lot of attention. And I'm wondering <laughs> if part of you was like, oh, dear. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, it was, it was, I feel like it was kind of scary. I think it's one of those things where it was like kind of scary. But I was also, I'm two years older, so I was still like a teenager. I was still in high school. Mm -hmm. So I remember, yeah, just being kind of scared. I remember I would go with, with Vanessa, my mom, or my dad to the hospital sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, uh. Yeah, it was just kind of a weird time, but I feel like I had a lot of freedom mm. um, because my parents were obviously very preoccupied with Vanessa. So I felt like I kind of, you know, was kind of doing my own thing and didn't have like a ton of supervision. And also, I would ask Jonah when he would get home from school who asked about me. Ah! Yes. <laughs> How did we know you weren't going to be an actress? Like, know, it's like I all know. the signs were all there. All the signs, all the signs. <laughs> um, so uh, talk a little bit about sort of um, 
what it's like working together on this podcast? Is it like, what's the collaboration like? Because I know with me and Jonathan, like every third week, we're practically not even speaking to each other when we sit down (laughs) in our chairs, either because of prep or like he didn't prep the way I wanted or like he wants me to ask a thing that I don't want. How have you found it? I found it pretty nice. And we, this is actually not the first project we've done together. When we were both in New York, we did this web series called Sound Advice, where Mm -hmm. we would have bands come on and I would play this media coach who would give them (laughs) condescending advice. And it would often be (laughs) bands that Jonah was like friends with. And Jonah, and that's, and we, we really had a nice time working together. We did it with our friend Pete Schultz and we like we would write all these things for me to say to the bands and then Joan would get so freaked out, even though I was the one who had to say it to them that he would sometimes have to like leave the room and stuff. When we were filming. <laughs> that happened one time I left the room. Okay. One time. <laughs> what what one kind time. of stuff? We were, um, well, this specific time we had Amy Mann and Ted Leo on. Where they have this band, The Both. And um, I said, why are you, something like, uh, are you called The Both because both of you are eligible for social security? It was like a, joke about them being old and <laughs> Jonah left the room. <laughs> it's funny. So sometimes things seem funny writing them at like the kitchen table. And then we have to do it in front of people you really respect and it basically <laughs> insult them. That's it's, the definition of being a performer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I couldn't deal, but they were very, they were great about it. You know, they were very funny and they didn't care, but, but they were great. They were great. They were very good sports. Yeah. No one, no one else cared. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so we wanted to work on something again together. And I think we're pretty good at, uh, at like, managing the responsibilities equally and sort mm-hmm. of, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'd love to, um, to ask you a little bit about your, your sort of path. I mean, you, you've already done so many, um, interesting, fascinating and important things. Um, Valerie, especially our producer is a big fan of your writing. And, um, I'm, I'm curious what, what made you want to, um, kind of go into the mental health field as it were. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I was in New York for 11 years and I was mostly, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in a band, um, you know, we would tour and put out records and, um, I was also writing about music. That was sort of my mm-hmm. full-time job. And then I moved out to Western Massachusetts, um, uh, with how close my, are my you to now, Vermont? I told her I you're very to, close I to Vermont. To know how close you are to I'm Vermont. I'm so close to Vermont. I'm like, very close to Vermont, but I, I came out here and um, to kind of joined my now wife. And um, I was kind of looking for something to do. And I'd always really been interested in psychology. And I had done a lot of interviews where I sort of got into this with artists, more of a journalistic interview. And I was interested in seeing how that would be different or the same as a therapeutic interview. So I, yeah, went back to grad school in 2019. And at about a year ago, I got my master's in clinical mental health counseling, and now I work in community mental health. And I want to work with, you know, musicians and artists on mental health, you know, anxiety, depression, substance abuse once I'm licensed. But I'm kind of my post, post-master's post pre-licensure, getting my hours and mm-hmm. learning a lot. And yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities and obviously just a huge need for mental health care for, you know, basically every population. Absolutely. So you went to school over COVID too, Yes. It was actually a low residency online program. Oh, cool. Um, and so we had two residencies, but they both ended up being over Zoom because of COVID. Mm-hmm. And I actually was diagnosed with leukemia in 2019, right before I started. That's right. And so I did kind of chemo my first semester, and then I kind of picked it up more full time. Different kind. Sorry, can we record scratch? <laughs> <laughs> Different kind of leukemia, but yeah. Different kind of leukemia. Very much more rare, but um, very treatable. What would you what would you say is kind of the most interesting to you about when you think about kind of working in, let's say, an artistic community or, or working with artists in terms of mental health? Because, um, you know, I, 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 I always talk about I think everyone can uh, benefit. And I think that if it if it isn't classical, you know, psychoanalysis, that there is a kind of introspection and, you know, having someone hold space for you um, in a therapeutic way that I believe everyone needs. I think it's a, you know, a human right to to have that. Um, but I, I also know as an artist, and I think you probably do as well, um, you know, there's a special profile that often goes with people who 
you know, either live for the applause or I'm the kind of performer that lives for other people's approval. Like I literally like that's my career is making you happy, you know, or satisfied or, you know. So are are there specific things that are interesting to you about the mental health of, you know, creatives? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I think you, you know, and I've listened to you speak on this. Like I've listened to you on Dan Harris's podcast and, um, you know, have some really com- interesting conversations about this type of stuff. And yeah, I think it's a really kind of unique lifestyle. I think it kind of lends itself to, you know, if you're performative, I think that can be a really positive thing, but it can, you know, it can also, you know, open up the door for a lot of other kind of issues, you know, involving ego, involving communications. I feel like bands can be incredibly dysfunctional because no mm-hmm. one really teaches each other how to communicate or express things and they can really build up and you have people depending on you and you know the lifestyle of of touring can be kind of inherently kind of dysfunctional and lead to sort of an arrested development um you know i feel like i've interviewed artists who can't don't know how to like set up their cable or something Mm because like people just do stuff for them their whole lives and i think then you hit 40 or something and it can be really difficult to navigate that stuff and obviously you know depression anxiety substance abuse Mm -hmm. um So I think, you know, it's not, you know, these are things that everyone kind of deals with, but I do think, you know, sort of the pressures and the lifestyle, especially of touring artists, is kind of a unique kind of lifestyle or setup. And I think someone who kind of comes from that world can maybe understand it a little more. Um, Yeah, possibly. But, you know, I I don't know. Uh, does that does that answer sort of? Yeah, no, I think it's it's actually I kind of feel like you're the you're the band whisperer. Um, and, <laughs> and no, and it's kind of it's an interesting path. I mean, you both have very interesting ways that you've come about sort of, you know, your the ways that you serve, really, the ways that you entertain and, and you know, kind of serve the community. But yeah, I think it's especially interesting that you kind of came at it, you know, from really an initially like journalistic and, you know, intellectual perspective and then kind of had an open enough heart, you know, to see this need. Um, you know, I'm also particularly interested in, um, you know, kind of like sexual dynamics of mental health that come, especially in the music world, because everything is so topsy-turvy and, you know, there's a real glamorization of, you know, in many cases, a, a, a treatment of of women that's, you know, really can be really problematic. But I also feel like, those are relationships, you know, meaning we're all in relation to each other and that stuff gets so magnified. So I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. And I I think it's also like, a it's interesting for me too. Like I would, you know, at this point in my life, I'm 43, I'd rather talk about, you know, uh, internal family systems or something than mm-hmm. like, wh- what are your influences on your new record? I mean, that stuff, <laughs> there's a place for it, but after doing that for 20 years. My influences years... for my new record is internal <laughs> family systems. Okay, so amazing, that, amazing, <laughs> amazing. So yeah, so I think there's a place for all stuff, but as I've gotten older, I was always kind of reading this stuff and I just find all the modalities and just learning about it just to be, yeah, I'm sure you do too, like so kind of interesting and mm-hmm. kind of, you learn so much about yourself in the process. Absolutely, I mean, you know, people who who choose to to be of service in the mental health um, world in particular, um, you know, that's being a healer. But often, you, you know, you're healing yourself in the process, you know, of healing. And I actually have friends um, at Antioch. And so it's a really, a really phenomenal school. Um, curious about both of your kind of experience with mental health personally. Do you both do transcendental meditation? Is that something you both have partaken in? Yes. and. I certainly I do I do TM 20 minutes twice a day. For how long have you had that practice? Um Jonah actually is the person who introduced me to it, which is why I said yes and no because I don't know that he does it as regularly now. I don't I don't I don't do it as regularly Vanessa. But Vanessa, how long have you been doing, doing that it since cuz Jonah told me about it and then when I was shooting Is that why you're train, so nice? <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's helped me a lot. Uh when I was doing train wreck with Amy Schumer, I noticed that she would meditate every lunch break that we had in her trailer. And I was like, okay, Jonah's doing it. Amy's doing it. I got to do it. Because also she was so, she was managing like the whole movie while, I mean, Judd was directing it, but she was like always like checking in with him and she was always like taking care of everything while still being calm. And I thought that seems really hard. Um, So then I, so then I, so that was probably nine, 90. That was probably, (laughs) it's probably been almost 10 years. Wow. So, 
for people who who may not know, can you explain what what TM is? Yeah. And Jonah, J- Jonah, do you do it at all ever? <laughs> do you no. have any mental health practice at all? I, and I, I I I do like I've been like a long time Ashtanga yoga pra- practitioner. Uh-huh. And He's I do, so good at yoga. If you do a yoga class with Jonah, the teacher's like, oh, I just want to talk to Jonah. And you're like, I'm in this class too. <laughs> um, but but I do I do some mindfulness stuff and, and meditation. But um, but no, I'm not nearly as as strict, strict with the TM. But yeah, Vanessa. As Amy um, <laughs> yeah, so Amy, yeah, but Vanessa, you're yeah, I think you're you really are pretty like you, you'll be oh hanging my. out with Vanessa and she'll be like okay I have to do this now okay, for so 20 t- minutes so, okay, for, for so people I do who it, don't know yeah so every morning and sometime in the afternoon every afternoon I do it for 20 minutes and basically you get a mantra which doesn't really mean anything it's just to focus you and it's a word it's a phrase it's a paragraph you're not allowed to say no but yeah. it's like a it's a thing that you rip Pete? Yes. Okay. And it's short. It's pretty short. Okay. So I would say it's closer to a word. Okay. And um, I, I, I and by the way, this? I didn't think that you were trying to get it out of me. I want to be clear. <laughs> oh, I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So who gives you this word? So whoever trains you. Okay. So, like a teacher. Yes. Yeah, so my teacher, who's one of the one of the co-founders of the David Lynch Foundation, Bob Roth, he's an amazing, amazing person who also trained Jonah, I think, right? No, he didn't train me, but we uh, we kind of worked together. Okay. Um, he kind of pre-trained me. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> Can't with this guy. Um, but anyways, <laughs> anyways, so so um, he he trained me for like th- I, three or four, I would think it's four days, and basically he's just teaching you. It's it's basically just getting you to um, you know have twenty minutes where you're conscious, but you're also sort of um, you're also sort of restful and. I think the um and you just say the word and you just say it and sometimes you forget to say it and then you remind yourself the thing that I like about TM and maybe the reason that I've been able to keep doing it is I'm very non-judgmental of myself with it so it's like even if I start just That's part of the practice yes and you don't have to clear your mind which to me is the most stressful thing about meditation <laughs> is clearing your mind because you're like okay I, I got then you're just stressing out the whole time about like right. oh I had a thought oh no you right. know so, to, so so for me, it's just like sometimes I'm able to just like focus on the mantra or whatever. Sometimes I start thinking of other things and, and then I, if I can remember, I'll stop. Sometimes I kind of, I don't know if this is part of TM. I don't think you're supposed to do this. But sometimes if I'm like trying to figure something out, I'll like wait until a few minutes into my TM and then I'll be able to think oh. through it with like zero emotion kind of That's where I can sort of. So, um, so I sort of like take it all. I think it all counts sometimes, especially if I do it like in the later afternoon, I'll fall asleep. You know, if I know I have something, I'll set an alarm. But, and in the morning when I do it, I always have to set an alarm in case I fall asleep because Hmm. I, um, are you laying down? I'm, I'm, you know, okay, well, look, I, I really wish that they would sponsor our podcast, but I did a commercial for Casper and I was able to get a Casper bed that can, oh. I can sit up in. Oh, but it's comfy. It's so comfy. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, so, but you're, so you're in a restful <laughs> state. Restful position. And is there like a kind of breathing that they teach you to do? No, but you're sort of supposed to, I usually do my mantra with my breathing. I okay. sort of focus on, yeah. And it's just, you're just sort of supposed to, um, focus on the mantra and just be calm and sort of, um, one of the things that my teacher would always say is like, he was taught that it's always calm under the waves. So it's like the water is always calm underneath Mm -hmm. and that's kind of where you try and get to. But Mm -hmm. I, I think the thing that has really helped me is I never like finish a meditation and go like, I really got there during this one. Mm -hmm. You know, like sometimes I, I never, I'm always like, I just come out of it and it is supposed to be cumulative. And I have noticed that in stressful situations, Mm -hmm. for the most part, I, stay pretty calm. Watch, they'll be like a little mouse runs past me when I leave and I'll be like, ah, fuck you. But um, I won't swear at the mouse. Okay, got it. Um, and um, can you talk a little bit about your yoga practice and how that's uh, an aspect of your mental health uh, maintenance? Yeah, sure. So I, yeah, I, I don't know how long, probably around 10 years, I, I started doing this practice of Ashtanga yoga called Mysore, where it's... Um, sort of like a self-guided practice, like you learn a sequence mm. and you're basically taught it posture by posture and you kind of add to it. Um, and so there's like a primary series, intermediate series. And so, um, yeah, what I like about it is, you know, it's very 
meditative, like you use this kind of ujjayi breathing, mm-hmm. this kind of deep, deep kind of chest breathing. And, um, you know, you're doing the same thing every day. So you can, if you walked into a studio, there were, it looked like everyone's doing something kind of different, but everyone could be huh. at like a different point in their own sequence. Um, and, you know, there's some really great teachers I studied with in, the, in New York, you know, um, you might know like Eddie Stern, who uh, he does a lot of writing about mindfulness and stuff with Deepak Chopra and stuff. But mm-hmm. but it's, yeah, it's really interesting. And what I liked about it also is you can kind of feel yourself pr- progress. Like you can, you know, one day you're doing something over and over every day. And then after three months, all of a sudden you couldn't, you know, touch your head to the ground where you couldn't do it before. So it mm-hmm. feels sort of like... I don't know. It feels very focused and it's, it's, but it's pretty intense. Like, especially some of the postures can be very, you know, some postures have taken me years to get into some I'll never be able to do. Yeah. But you can do so many of them and it's kind of like, we get it. Is he bendy? So bendy. And also is like going backwards and like he's hands. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, I can barely stand up. Does your wife do yoga too? (laughs) Yes. My wife does too. Yeah. Um, And yeah. And a lot of the, yeah, like I said, it's just cumulative. It's just like, it's just takes kind of years, but it's, um, you know, you can, you can adjust stuff. You can, you know, yeah. I want to ask you both uh, one thing before we wrap up. And we have to tell you about the show we did about Blossom too. Oh yeah. We can do that also. (laughs) First, let me ask this question. Then we can do that. Um, You know, you've both just mentioned uh, a practice that really takes years. You, you, you both kind of have hit on something about a kind of cumulative, you know, uh, wellness. Um, you know, a lot of people listen to this podcast because they're struggling or they feel confused. Um, we like to ask our guests, like, if you could speak directly, you know, to people, um, specifically to that point of kind of the, the importance of stick to itness, maybe, um, about, kind of a mental health or wellness practice, what what would sort of your suggestion be for people? Ma'am, I think like what you're saying is really, really, really like a really great observation. And I think, um, I think it's, I would say it's always like most difficult to get started hmm. with something. Um, so I think just, you know, just doing it that first time, it's always going to be the most difficult and it can seem really daunting. Hmm. But um, the more you do it, you, you do something and whatever it is, find something that works for you and just, you know, do it for five minutes a day mm. and just, um, know it's going to get easier and you can always do it for longer. But I think it's just that sort of initial getting started is, is really difficult. So just, you know, mm. practicing compassion around that. And just, I, I've tried a lot of different things before I land. I did a lot of different types of meditation, a lot of different types of yoga, different types of teachers. So I think it's just, you know, finding that thing that works for you and just, you know, doing it and then just sort of not judging it and, you know, not having ego around it and just, you know, letting it kind of become part of your routine is what I would say. It's lovely. Vanessa, your turn. Yeah, I would say I agree with everything Jonah said. I also think, (laughs) I think the thing that is so nice about whatever practice you find that works for you is that you're resting, but you're conscious. I Mm. think that's the thing that really gives you it's it, the thing that like about sleep is it's so great, but you're not conscious for it. So you don't get to like absolutely bask in it. You know what I mean? Whereas like if you can find some meditation or yoga or something that allows you to sort of quiet your mind and and just have that time for yourself um, that's restful, that's going to absolutely rock. I think that's a really, <laughs> no, I think that's a really um, important point because I think a lot of people feel like, I have to reach nirvana. Like I better meditate. And if I don't like feel amazing, then I did it wrong or it's not working for me or I can't be fixed. Right. And that notion that, um, there's, I think my, my yoga teacher, you know, he talks about that place of kind of like, like tension and ease. You know, you want to find that point when you hold a pose. And I think it's true when you interact with humans. Yeah. You want to find that place where it's like right at the edge of like, this is comfortable and easy, but I'm also working the hardest that I can, you yeah. know, to to perfect it, to improve on it. Um, so I, I really like that that notion. Um, okay, what was this blossom okay, thing okay. that you did? So we had this thing. It was around the time we were doing our, our web series. We had this thing called series finale, but we only did it once. Okay. And we did this show at the Bell House in Brooklyn where we showed 
we invited an audience. We had, it was you, me, jo- j- meaning Jonah, me, Kyle Mooney, and Jenna Von Oy, who played six, right? That was and the And Laura piano. Stevenson. Oh, and played, Laura Stevenson played the, theme song. played the theme song. She played a beautiful rendition of the theme song for Blossom. Uh-huh. And we showed the finale, and then, which again, was so hard to get. I mean, I was getting I'm half- sorry, you sh- you showed it? We yeah. showed it to the I audience. I think we're like, legally, we weren't really probably shouldn't have shown and it. it, but, it, it but I mean, I don't have and rights to it. let me tell you this. I'm just trying to picture this. Trying to get it, it's, I went through, it's, Im- it's not, it's actually has not been syndicated. It's insane. Yeah, I it literally, doesn't exist. I got like my Facebook, someone said they'd send it to me and I got like hacked from it because yeah. it was like, it's impossible. <laughs> Somehow we found like a kind of blurry version online, but it is crazy. There's no no DVDs exist. There's like, you can't. So the first two seasons were released by Shout Factory and no others. We we were a Disney show and we think that's part of the complexity, just for okay. point of reference, as to why we sort of fell into this weird space of like every other show from that era. It's you, crazy. I know. It's a whole thing. But anyway, okay, go ahead. Okay, anyways. Um, so you showed it. We showed it. To an audience. And then we talked about it with the audience and with Jenna. And we, it was, it was like a thrilling it was a truly a thrilling evening of just talking about the finale of Blossom <laughs> and people, abs- I think, absolutely loved it. Jenna let me try in her hat that she wore in um, in the opening was it purple? sequence. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. And she also gave me a Jenna doll. I was just working in my attic last night and I have dolls. So I have yes. her, the Joey, and and the me, and the me doll. The mama doll, um, as my kids call it. And they're gem size. They, that's right. Right? So they are not Barbie size. No, they're just... They're not skipper size, just like right in the middle. Yeah, yeah. They're... And I remember the thing that I love about th- that doll, first of all, she has multiple piercings, which at the time was like, oh my God, I have more than one piercing. I'm like, do we put it in a doll? I'm like, what's next? Tattoos and drugs? You know, like it was the, the early 90s. But I remember when I saw that doll, like they gave her a, a, a prominent nose. Like, because I didn't want a Barbie doll nose. Yes. With yes. all due respect to women who have a Barbie doll nose and Barbie herself. Like, yes. I, and I remember I looked at her and I was like, it looks more like me than not. That's and I was inc- I was really Can proud of imagine? that. imagine? That's so crazy that there's a Blossom doll that you it's have. It's weird. It's so cool. It's really, it's been a real pleasure to oh talk to God. both of you. Can we do a rapid fire? It's rapid, and you can each give a quick answer to our rapid fire. Okay. (sighs) All right. Who goes first, Jonah, you or me? Vanessa, you go first. Okay. Okay. Rapid fire with Vanessa Bayer and Jonah Bayer. What was your mother right about? Hmm. (laughs) So many things, but the first thing that comes to mind is getting sleep. (laughs) Okay. Jonah? Um, uh, Saving money. I don't know. (laughs) She, you so, should save money. She's so yeah. she's such a great mom, and we did not do her justice just now. <laughs> no, we I, didn't. I, I'm so into it. What was your father right about? I, I'd like to believe he's right that he's the first Todd. <laughs> I'm sorry. He thinks he's the first person to ever be named named Todd. <laughs> <laughs> but also, other stuff, Jonah. Yeah, our dad uh, <laughs> was right about Esperanto being a yeah. universal language oh. that Vanessa and I, as kids, <laughs> thought he made that up. Turns out he was right. He was right about Esperanto as well. And other things. We're really, we're really kind of making our parents. This. Your parents come sound up. amazing. <laughs> Location that promotes your best mental health. Oh, I would say being on the beach, completely covered up. So I'm getting no sun, but being on the beach. <laughs> That's what happens with people with your complexion. How about uh, you, Joe? Wild- wilderness, trees, forest, I think. Got it. Um, well, the next question is: do you have a mantra? So you're going to say yes, and it's secret. Yeah, yes, um, and it's secret. But do you have um, an aphorism or a saying that you like that kind of reflects your perspective? You know what I love to remind myself of? I love reminding myself of the phrase, that, like, you're exactly where you should be. Like, we're always exactly where we should be. Even when it's hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, anything Eckhart Tolle says, pretty much. Oh. But also, okay. um, also, I don't mind what happens. I think that's a Christian Murdy quote. That's a really good one. Oh, I like that. I, I guess that. Um, who's been your best spiritual teacher? I think in a lot of ways, our mom. So I guess I'm coming hmm. back to around and You're giving redeeming her. her. <laughs> yeah. In a lot of ways, my mom. Our mom. Yeah. Not that you yeah. have to also say your uh, mom, but you're Jonah, kind now of, you have to I say I feel like I kind of do have to say it now. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think also Eckhart like Tolle, like me and my wife are, are super into, um, you know, Power of Now and New mm-hmm. Earth and his teachings. And I've learned a lot about just being in the present moment and kind of accepting my life situation through him. So he's he's amazing. Awesome. Uh, do you have a moment of best intuition? I can do mine. I'll do mine first. I have one that came to mind, which I don't know if this is my best mo- moment of best intuition, but I remember when I auditioned for SNL, I auditioned in Chicago Then they flew me to New York and they said, do your best five minutes. And apparently a lot of people do a totally different, like they, they do, they do one thing in their first audition and then they completely change it and do all new stuff in their second audition. But there's all these new people at your second audition and there's all the, it's a totally different setup and they haven't seen you and they're filming it and it's a totally different. So I did almost the same exact thing Mm. and they were like, that's what you were supposed to do. Now, was I doing the thing they told me to do? Yes. But, but I think, um, intuitively, intuitively, I knew not to like change it too much. Wow. That's awesome. I think, uh, you know, I bought this guitar when I was, uh, in college and I I saved up every week for it. This, um, electric guitar, I was like obsessed with it. And I gave a hundred dollars each week and it seemed like so much money back then, but I still have it like 20 years later and I've, Mm. I've, it's been all over the world with me. And so I think buying that guitar and, and saving for it as a college student was, was great intuition. This is a fun question to ask two people who have worked together a lot and are siblings. Who are you most competitive with? Not Jonah. I I don't think, no, 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 not Jonah, not Jonah. I mean, I'm competitive with Jonah. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say something that's a joke that is actually kind of real. It's like, I'm still competitive with like, I'm still like mad about certain roles that I was cast in in middle school theater. And I'm like, I'm still sort of feel competitive with like those, uh, like direct, you know, those people where I'm like, you guys should, uh, is this, uh, okay. Rum Tum Tugger. Taewon Kim was cast instead of me. Fifth grade. Oh my God. Go ahead, Jonah. Well, (laughs) don't even know who that is. (laughs) I know who you are. I feel so. like, you know, I do feel like I can just be competitive. Can you be competitive with yourself? Yes. I don't know. It's, Maybe I'm that's most actually, common answer. That was going to be my okay. most common answer. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. It feels like kind of a cop out a little bit, but I do feel like we can well, then really, yeah, be competitive okay. with ourselves. I'm most competitive with Jonathan, who's not here today. So okay. I'm winning today. Last question. What do you know to be true? I really do think we're all exactly where we should be. Yeah, I think everything everything passes, whether it's good or bad, it's it's not going to last forever. So, you know, you're going to get through it somehow, either way. Beautiful. Please check out How Did We Get Weird with Vanessa Bayer and Jonah Bayer wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever. Is that how you do it? That's what I'd say. Anything else we can direct people to, to learn more about you? I guess just listening to the podcast, which, okay. you're, which <laughs> we're hoping to have my mom very soon. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> We're on social on media you. on uh, a little bit. And uh, I have a website, jonahbayer.com. I don't really update that much, but you can <laughs> check it out. <laughs> great. Great. <laughs> that's, a gr- that's a great plug. Um, Maybe I'll and, update it now. And if you have not seen uh, I Love That For You, you also won a Gracie Award for that. I did, yes. Thank you so very much. Um, all right. Well, thank you. From, uh, from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we'll see you next time. Ooh, what a good sign off. It's my B. Alex breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one fiction. And now she's going to break down. 